I come from the uh, Sean Killian School of Preaching, so uh, when I told him I forgot to bring my Spurgeon quote, he said I had to say something about Spurgeon, so since it fits, and since he's my elder, I think I'll give you a little illustration about Charles Spurgeon, which I just heard. A lady was visiting Spurgeon's church in England, and um, heard his sermon, and after he was finished, she followed him into his study and said, Mr. Spurgeon, that was, that was the greatest sermon I've ever heard. You exalted the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't wait to come and hear you next week. The following week, the same lady shows up and listens to Spurgeon's message, and uh, once again, she follows him into the study, this time with a very sour look on her face, and she said, Mr. Spurgeon, that was not a very good sermon at all. What happened in one week? And he said, ma'am, it's very simple what happened in one week. Last week, you came to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ speak. This week, you came to listen to Charles Haddon Spurgeon. I hope you haven't come this morning to hear Ken Murphy or Rick Hallahan or anybody else. I hope you've come here to hear the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ken Murphy uh, came down with, um, he's sick. And I just want to tell you this. Ken Murphy, my beloved pastor, can preach the gospel better than I can. But he can't preach a better gospel. And so I will preach the gospel this morning with everything I know. Turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Joshua, and we'll look at chapter 2. Book of Joshua, chapter 2. I'll be reading verses 1 through 15. Joshua, chapter 2. If you have a Bible, you can open. I'm reading from New King James, so if you have a different version, it might be better for you just to listen. Joshua 2, verses 1 through 15. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened as the gate was being shut when it was dark that the men went out, and where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Then the men pursued them by the road to Jericho, to the fords, and as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you, and you came out of Egypt, and uh, what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted, neither did they did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you? For the Lord your God, he is the God in heaven, above and on the earth beneath. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my family's house and give me a true token. And spare my father and my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. So the men answered her, our lives for yours. If none of you tell this business of, your, of ours, and it shall be when the Lord has given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with you. 
Then she let them down by a rope through the window, for her house was on the city wall, and she dwelt on the wall. Let's go over to James chapter 2. I'm going to be reading verses 24 through 26. James chapter 2, if you're following along, verses 24 to 26. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. <laughs> supposed to be Reformation Sunday. What am I reading that for? Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Let us pray. Father, I come before this text and both texts, humbled, frightened, weak, and heavy laden. I come with but one thing I know for sure, that Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords that he has sent his spirit into our hearts, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, that all that we need for life and godliness is supplied by him, even in this very hour. And now, Father, as we look at these texts, let not me speak, but let the Holy Spirit speak. Let me die, let me move aside, let me shrink into the floor, but let God, God speak, please. For that is my only hope, and that is the only hope of our hearers. Bless our dear Pastor Murphy that you would raise him up from his sickbed quickly, Father, and bring him back to us very shortly. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. As Pastor Nate said, this is Reformation Sunday, and I believe Ken wanted me to say something about the Reformation. An emaciated man decked out in clerical garb of an Augustinian monk lumbers down a cobblestone road in the Saxon village of Wittenberg. His gait is slow and determined. In his hand is a billboard announcement, along with a hammer and several nails. He reaches the chapel of, uh, the, of the Wittenberg Castle and slowly but deliberately nails the paper to its door in Latin. This is not a public announcement, but a private invitation to scholars to debate some disturbing issues of the day mainly on the forgiveness of sins related to the sale of indulgences. Now, indulgences were a promise that could be purchased from the Pope that gave one a reduction of the penalty for sin. Indulgences had both an inward aspect, that is, the buyer must show an inward penitence, and an external aspect, which was the actual purchase of the indulgence and a receipt for the certificate. The combination of these two things would then mystically tap into a treasury of righteousness managed by the Pope himself. Upon payment of the funds, the Pope, through his authorized sales agent, would apply that righteousness to one's case and lower or completely wipe out the penalty for one's sin in purgatory. This reduction of the penalty could be used for the buyer's own benefit or be used to help the, uh, the poor soul of a loved one who was presently in purgatory. Unbeknownst to that monk, this seemingly insignificant invitation to debate would light a fire across the medieval world, sparking a civil war within the church that would not stop until half of Europe had broken free of the Pope's authority. We call this the Reformation. The monk was Martin Luther. The date of the posting of this invitation is this very date, October 31st, the year 1517, 504 years ago. And the ramifications of this announcement posted on the castle door continue to this day. Now, many think that Luther was arguing for the doctrine of justification by faith alone. That is, a sinner is saved solely by an act of faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. This is entirely incorrect. At this time in his life, Luther had not yet come to this conviction. 
It would be another three to four years before he would. No, at this time of his life, Luther was upset at one thing, that a person could be forgiven for their sins without any show of good works. Luther, a pastor himself, had seen many of his congregants buying an indulgence and then resting in the vain hope that this piece of paper that they were holding in their hand could get them to heaven. They could live however they wanted, but so long as they had that paper, they were saved. This angered the monk, who himself had been so sensitive to sin that he had spent days and months trying to atone for his sin through what he thought were good works, self-flagellation, denial of food and drink, and hours and hours of confession of his sins. It was this mockery that, um, that Luther saw and thus posted those 95 theses. As the Reformation moved forward, Luther, now thrust in the midst of a titanic battle, began to understand two things. First, that salvation came by faith alone through the grace of God alone, what we all know and love. We call that sola fide. It was a hallmark of the Reformation. But there was a second corrective of the Reformation that was just as important, the place of good works in the life of the believer. What many of us don't realize is that it was this second aspect that really brought Luther into the fray. Let us read several of these propositions. Proposition number three. The Word of God does not teach solely an inter inner repentance. Such repentance is worthless unless it produces various outward mortifications of the flesh. That's his way of saying works. Thesis 45. A person who, um, who passes by a beggar but buys an indulgence will gain the anger and disappointment of God. In other words, buying an indulgence means nothing. It's helping the beggar that Luther was going after. As a matter of fact, nothing in the 95 Theses talk about faith alone at all. When Luther was, what Luther was concerned about was a salvation that displayed no change in life whatsoever. We often forget that this was Luther's primary issue with the church. At the end of the day, the Reformation produced one thing for which we can all be eternally grateful. It did not invent any new parts or any new doctrines, nor did it come up with a new and exciting way of being saved. What it did was to adjust the doctrines that the Roman church already had believed in by putting them in their proper context. It's the relationship of doctrine to doctrine that the Reformation was going for. The church believed in grace. The church believed that Jesus Christ died on the cross for sinners. The church even believed in faith. The church believed in good works. That wasn't the problem. The problem was how they were putting these doctrines together, and it was so muddled and so mixed up that nobody ever knew at all how one could possibly be saved. One thing more need to be said about Martin Luther. He was far from perfect. He had many foibles and bad habits and sins. We, we follow not this man we follow his understanding of the Word of God to the extent that he understood it correctly. One place where Luther was clearly wrong was that it is an opinion of the book of James. He did not cut it out of the list of sacred books, but he did set it off to the side as an epistle of straw. By saying James was an epistle of straw, um, he was not saying it was wrong or that it didn't belong in the Bible. He was merely saying that it had a value equal to that of straw, which we know has very few noble usages. Luther's problem with James was that it seemed to contradict the logical argumentation of Paul, whom Luther loved, about the way of salvation. 
Because of Luther's opinion, many opponents of the Reformation have used Luther's obvious dissatisfaction with James to say the Reformation was a fraud. What could come of a movement that didn't appeal to every part of the Bible? So people have often used James and said, well, the Reformation is not true because even Luther thought that James was a little bit screwy, so maybe the whole thing really doesn't make any sense anyway. Maybe we're just worshiping a man or a movement, but really not what the Bible teaches. This morning, I wish to show that the Reformation was the complete package. By going right into the heart of the enemy's territory, that is the book of James, and preaching the Reformation from the book of James. I do this according to the adage, we kill error with its own weapon. We shall do this by looking at the life of Rahab, which we found discussed already in James chapter 2. We find that in the life of Rahab, the entire full teaching of the Reformation, and we believe that the book of James teaches it all. Don't throw James out of your Bible. So much more than appearing to be contrary to the Reformation, James actually furthers the Reformation, actually fills out the Reformation, actually is a capstone to all that the Apostle Paul said. Two points is all we've got this morning. First, Rahab the harlot was saved by faith and faith alone. Secondly, Rahab's faith was vindicated by works alone. First of all, then, Rahab the harlot was saved by faith and faith alone. Let's go back to the second chapter of Joshua, or you can just listen. What is it that caused Rahab to receive those spies, those Jewish spies that were looking to cross over the river and to conquer the promised land? What, what caused her to accept them? Well, I think it's found in verse 10, where Rahab, they, you know, I mean, you know the story, and I'm not going to get too explicit here, but the two men uh, go into Jericho at night, and they go into a, a harlot's apartment. Now, what better place to hide than that, right? Nobody's going to look for you there, at least I hope not. So they sneak into her apartment, not knowing the providence of God, and that this was in God's eternal decree, and they start conversing with her. And all of a sudden, they, they find out that she really wants to be on their side. And she says in verse 10, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites. What's the first thing that Rahab did? Good works? Not a chance. She heard about God. Not only did she hear about God, she heard about the works of God. She heard about the leading of Yahweh with the Israelites over or through the Red Sea and the conquest of all these kings. She had heard all the stories about this great God of the Jews who performed miracle upon miracle in the wilderness. And as she heard that, faith began to be engendered in her soul. They go back to James chapter 2, and it says, you see then that man is justified by works, verse 24, and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works? Now, we're going to look at that, because that sounds like a contradiction. Like, like one portion, portion of the Bible saying, saved by faith, and another one saying, saved by works. We're going to have to look at that. We have to deal with that. If you don't deal with it, then you've got a Bible that contradicts itself, and that will never do. Let me go uh, with you back a couple pages to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. Let's read something more about Rahab. It says in verse 31 of chapter 11 of Hebrews, by faith, stop right there, by faith, by faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. Rahab, according to the author of Hebrews, was saved by faith. Can James be saying anything different than that? No. Jesus also adds in his opinion about all of this, in Matthew chapter 21, 
And I invite you to turn there if you want, otherwise just listen. Verse 28 of Matthew 21, talking about the two sons, the obedient and the disobedient one. But what do you think? A man had two sons. This is Matthew 21, verse 28. And he came to the first and said, son, go to work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And they said to him, the first. And Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, now here, here's what I want to get at, that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. Perhaps he had Rahab in mind, certainly the woman that washed his feet, perhaps. Now, notice what he says in verse 32. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots, what? Believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. So what Jesus is saying is that tax collectors and harlots come into the kingdom of heaven, not by anything they've done, but by what they've believed, right from the words of Jesus Christ. Rahab's the harlot. Jesus is talking about tax collectors and harlots. He says they get saved by one way and one way only. They believe the word of God. We just proved that Rahab heard the word of God. Hebrew says by faith, Rahab did what she did. By faith, by faith, by faith. What kind of faith was it that Rahab had? We're going to look at that briefly. This is still under the first heading of Rahab the harlot was saved by faith and faith alone. First of all, her faith was a faith in, in something that could not be seen. Rational, yes, but not sensually provable. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. She has a faith like we have. Anybody here ever seen Jesus? I hope not. Not in the body. Anybody here ever seen him dying on a cross? I doubt it. I'm not that old. Why do you believe? You believe on the testimony of the Bible. Can anybody prove it? No. Is it, is it irrational? Absolutely not. It's very rational. We have a rational faith. She had heard about the coming of the Israelites through the wilderness. She heard about things that were true. She didn't see them, but she believed them. You, you, don't, you believe in Jesus, but you don't see him. And it's that belief of the things not seen that saves you. And it saved Rahab. So it was a faith that could not be seen, but was real. Secondly, it was an assured faith. Look at verse 9 of Joshua 2, if you're still there. And she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us. She says, I know. Well, how could she know? She knows because faith is a gift of God that gives you assurance of what you believe. Yes, it's a mystery. Nobody can prove the things that we believe. But we know beyond a shadow of a doubt of the things that we do believe about Jesus Christ, about the Bible, and about salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. You see, everybody's faith in this room who's saved has a faith that's assured. Now, let me, let me back up a second and say that does not mean that everybody has a full assurance of faith. We all have times when we struggle with our faith. I do and you do. But everybody in this room that truly believes is assured of the things spoken of in the Word and in the words of Jesus Christ. She knew that, that the, uh, the God of the Israelites had done all the things that she had heard. She just knew it. Why didn't anybody else in the city of Jericho know it? I don't know. They didn't have the gift of faith, but she did. She was assured. She had a, an assured faith. And thirdly, 
she had a very weak and somewhat ignorant faith. I want you to notice in verse 4, and this, this, this I hope will comfort you. A lot of people in here, myself included, that have a checkered faith, it's at times very weak, very mixed, very mottled, very inconsistent. Look at what she does. Verse 4, then the woman took the two men and hid them. And so she said, yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. She lies. There have been a whole lot of pages spent on trying to figure out, well, how could Rahab lie and still be a believer? Let's just forget that. What the Bible's trying to tell you is that she had a faith, but it wasn't a pure faith. It was a weak faith. Have you ever had a faith that lied? I have. You have. Does that mean you're not saved? No, it means your faith is weak. It's strengthening each and every day, I trust. And then the day Christ takes you home, it will be perfectly full. Not only was it a weak faith because she didn't understand some of the moral precepts, but it was a weak faith because she was in a bartering mode of thinking with God. Look at verse 12. Now, therefore, I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you may also show kindness to my father's house and give me a true token. You see, how, how could someone be saved that believes that, uh, you know, you, God shows me kindness, and therefore I must uh, show God kindness, or I show God kindness, and he shows me kindness? That's a, a tit-for-tat kind of faith. We would all agree that's not the kind of faith we should have. But that was the kind of faith that she had, she didn't understand purely or fully. She's trying to barter with the spies. Interesting, I learned this week about the prodigal son, something I'd never seen. Prodigal son is eating pig slop. Finally says, I will arise and go to my father, Luke 18, 13. Or 15 something, whatever, not 18. And he goes and starts coming back to the father. And on the way back to the father, what's, what's the son saying? Well, I'll barter with my dad a little bit. I'll be willing to become a slave and just work kind of like in the, in, the, in the barn or pitch hay or milk the cows. I'll do something really menial. I'll, 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 uh, I'll try to get the father's goodwill by doing something for him. That's not a pure faith, beloved. And you notice in the story that the father looks, runs to the son, sees the son over the hillside, uh, runs to him, mentions nothing about the agreement that the, father, that the son wanted to give him, simply loves the son, gives him the robe, puts the ring on, slays the fatted calf, and says, the one that was lost is now found. But you know something? We do the same thing. Come on, we do it. We barter with God. God, I had a good day today. You're going to do something good for me. God, I had a bad day today. You're going to punish me. You see, our faith is checkered. It's not pure. So don't let, don't let Rahab's faith bother you. It's the faith that we all have. Faith is not pure. It never will be this side of heaven. Assured, yes. Pure, no. And so she had a faith on something that could not be seen. It was an assured faith. She knew that what, what she was hearing about Yahweh was true, and it was a faith that was weak and somewhat ignorant. Now, that doesn't answer the question of James. That just simply says that it seems that the preponderance of evidence in the Bible is that Rahab was saved, as we are, by faith, and faith alone. I gave you the text. But now we go back to James, and we have to read it again and try to figure out what James is saying. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Wait a minute. That's not what I just said. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? What's going on here? Well, I think there's several things going on here, but, but for 
uh, in the, in the uh, goodwill of time, let me try to cut right to the chase. First of all, we got to think about this word justification. Now, most of us have always heard, going through Romans and so on, Galatians, we always think of justification as a declaration of righteousness. And it is. But it also has another meaning. Very similar, but just a couple degrees to the right. It can also mean vindication. Justification is a declaration from the court, a legal term, that you are innocent. Got nothing to do with your works, just a declaration from God. Vindication means that the declaration that you have is evidenced by something people can see. In other words, faith is vindicated, not justified, vindicated by works. You say, well, where do you get that from? Let's go back again to the words of Jesus, who uses that word, by the way. Matthew chapter 11, and then we'll look at Matthew chapter 12, and I could have gone to several other texts, but again, for interest of time, we, we have to move along. Matthew chapter 11, verse 19. I want you to get this. This is really important. Because if you see James talking about faith being a vindication, not a declaration, you got it. Look at uh, Matthew, again, eleven nineteen. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified, same word, by her children. What does that mean? Well, if you go back into context, he's simply talking about those that were, were doing things in the marketplace and, and so on and making good choices and making bad choices and all of this. What Jesus is saying that wisdom is vindicated by what it produces. Wisdom does not need to be declared righteous. It doesn't mean that. If you stick that in the text, it is nonsensical. But if you use the word justified in the sense of vindication, it makes perfect sense. For wisdom is vindicated by her children or by what she produces. Get that? Wisdom is vindicated by the fruit. You see, you can't, nobody can see wisdom. I can't see wisdom in anybody. The only time I can see wisdom is what you do. Either it's wise or it's not. Wisdom is justified by her children, vindicated. Look at Matthew, the next chapter, Matthew chapter 12, verse 37. Jesus says this, by your words you will be justified and by your words, you will be condemned. Well, if that simply means declared righteous, then we've got a real problem with Jesus and Paul. But I don't think that's what he's saying. He's saying, by your words, you will be vindicated. You will show forth the fruit of your faith by your words. In one case, by your wisdom, here by your words. Look it, you can't see faith, you can't see wisdom. You can only see what they produce. For by your words you will be justified and by, or vindicated if you, want, if you wish, and by your words you will be condemned, shown to be a phony. Go back to James. Likewise was not Rahab the harlot also vindicated, vindicated by her works? when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. In other words, what James is saying, not contradicting Paul, what he's saying is that the faith of Rahab, which I hopefully have already proved is what saved her, showed forth itself, manifested itself, displayed itself in what she did. It's the only way you can look at it. And that gives us a full reformation. Yes, salvation is by faith and faith alone. 
Luther said we are saved by faith alone, but not a faith that is alone. Even Luther agrees with the book of James, even though he was afraid to admit it. And so we find out that Rahab was saved by faith, and that that faith was vindicated in what she did as she received the slave, uh, the uh, spies, and sent them out a different way. Let me illustrate it a couple ways about this relationship between faith and works. See, what the Reformation did was get the faith and works in the right place. For example, um, I typed up this introduction today on my computer. Now, it'd be ridiculous for me to have turned on the printer and printed it before I wrote this up. What would I have gotten? Nothing. Right? Nothing. I had to print it up and then hit the printer. Printing it up is faith. Hitting the printer and seeing the manifest, manifestation of what I wrote is works. They go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. But what really produced this? Was it the printer? No. It was the work that I put into it as I typed it up. Farming illustration. You got a big field. You got a little kernel of corn. Oh, you want, to, you want to plant corn in your field. Let's just say a big field. You want to plant corn. What do you do? Somebody gives you a whole bunch of little corn kernels, and you go out and you start to plant them. And what happens? Weeks, months later, the corn pops up, and you start to watch it and see all the, the bud and the grain and all the fruit that's coming out of it. What produced that plant? The kernel of corn. The plant did not produce the plant. The kernel of corn is faith. That's what makes the plant grow. That's what produced the plant. The manifestation or the works is the fruit itself, the plant itself that pops up. And on and on and on and on we could go about how faith saves us and faith alone, but faith will always vindicate itself in works. Now, to close, and then I'll give a few applications that will be done, let's figure out exactly what those works are, because this is where we really get mixed up. I want you to look, look back in, again, uh, Joshua chapter 2, verse 13. She's bartering again back and forth with these spies, and she says, and spare my father, my mother, my brothers, my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. What did her faith produce? It produced a love for others. You want to know what your faith must produce. There's a lot of other things we could throw in. Bible reading and prayer and this and that and the other thing. But the one thing that you must have that proves that you have faith in Jesus Christ is that you love God and love your neighbor. Or let me say it this way, that you love God by loving your neighbor. Nobody here can tell me they just love God and don't love their neighbor. First John teaches that. Let me ask you a question. Do you love the people of God? Do you love your relatives, your neighbors, people sitting in the pew? Can you not wait to get here on a Sunday morning or in your community group? Or do you just slink in the back door and rush out as fast as you possibly can? Because I don't want to know anybody here. I just want to hear a sermon and leave. The proof, the fruit, the major fruit, that you have actually trusted in Jesus Christ is that you love his body and you love people. That's what Rahab did, and I would suggest to you that's what Jesus said. The lawyer said, what are the two greatest commandments? Love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and let me give you the second one, 
Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor. That's the, he says this sums up all the law and the prophets. If you're not loving your neighbor, don't come to me and tell me you've got faith. It's bogus. Now, I want to encourage you after that, because I don't love anybody in this room like I should. I fall way short, way, way short. Do I love people here? I think so. Not perfect, not even close to being perfect. And that's the question you need to ask yourself. So let me apply this about Rahab. I find it really, really comforting that the James shows the two great illustrations of a saved person being Abraham, first of all. And we know he's the father of faith. He was saved by faith. And everybody says, oh, Abraham, what a great guy he was, right? Father of the Jews, father of faith, this, that, and the other thing. And Rahab, a heathen harlot. We have some heathen harlots in the church right now. We have people that are coming in from non-Christian backgrounds, have been in drugs, pornography, you name it, and they're being saved. This is the most wonderful thing that could possibly happen. You see, Rahab gives us hope that anybody that slinks in the back door and hears the gospel can be saved. Rahab proves that to us. She had no Christian background. She had no Christian upbringing. She didn't know the Bible. She knew nothing. But she heard about God by the preaching of what God had done. And she believed. Have you come in this morning that way? Maybe you're sitting in the back. You can't wait to leave, but you've heard the gospel I want to tell you this morning, whoever you might be, that if you simply trust in Jesus Christ, I don't care what your background is. I don't care what sins you're involved with at the present time. That you believe in Jesus Christ and him alone, he will save you on the spot. You believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. You have no hope in and of yourself to fix yourself, to be who you should have been. You believe Christ is your Savior. He'll save you. That's the first thing. Second thing, never let us as a church snuff out the flickering faith of young and imperfect faiths. You've never flickered mine out, and it's young and imperfect, and I pray that I will do the same for you. One thing the young disciples have taught me, and much more than I've ever taught them, was to understand where they're at and stop being arrogant and expecting them to be way like into the college of faith or the master's program or the doctorate of faith. Take people where they are. When you see the flicker of faith, don't snuff it out. Inflame it. Fan it. Help it along. Please do that. So many times we want to say, oh, that person can't be saved. They're doing that, or they said this, or this attitude, or that, or whatever. Let us stop doing that. If someone truly believes in Jesus Christ, we got some new believers here. Help them along, please. And I need to do the same thing. And let us never forget, thirdly, that love for our neighbor is the great indicator of faith, not intellectualism, not memorization, not prayer, not Bible reading. Do I, do I sound heretical enough yet? <laughs> Loving your neighbor. All the other stuff is good. Do it. But loving people. Do you want to be here? Do you want to love the guy next door, the workmate, the lady at King Supers, the irritating relative? Oh, it's so hard. That shows that you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. A man is, comes into a courtroom and 
shackles. Heads down, he's committed crimes, he feels awful. As he walks into that courtroom, he hears the hoots and the hollers and the, and the ridicules of the, the crowd in the courtroom. And he can't even look at the judge, and the judge says, uh, looks at the, uh, the dossier there, and he says, uh, Mr. So-and-so, uh, I know you've committed all these crimes, but this, this is amazing. Somebody has already paid your entire debt. You're innocent. Take off the shackles. What do you think that man's going to do when the shackles are taken off? You think he's going to stand there like this? That'd be stupid. He's been in shackles for all these months, maybe years, and finally the shackles are taken off. What's he going to do? He's going to start to dance. He's going to, he's going to move his limbs. He's going to run around the courtroom and say, I'm free. I'm free. You see, faith, the declaration of the judge is justification by faith. The taking off the shackles, which always leads to doing something, is the works. And you get them in the right order, and you've got the full gospel. It's both and. Saved by faith alone. We're also vindicated. That faith is also vindicated by the works that we do. May you have both in your life. Trust in Jesus Christ. And now that you're free, you will labor for him for all the days of your life. Let us pray. Father, thank you. God, I don't know why I'm saved. I have no idea why I'm standing up here. Except you've taken off the shackles of a a rotten sinner. Now made free by your sovereign grace. And many sitting here today, this morning, in this church, are the same. They've been freed. And now they can dance. They've been declared righteous, and now they can show forth that righteousness by working for you. Oh, Lord Jesus, help this church to love both these great truths, the Pauline doctrine of justification by faith alone, and the the doctrine of James, that that faith will always produce works for the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you in Jesus' name.